Well, now that you've actually seen three new contemporary pieces for bass trombone, one completely solo, one with uh, pre-recorded media, and one with piano, and two pieces for the carnix, you might perhaps like to know how I do the things I do on the carnix and what the relationship is to the trombone. This is a bass trombone, as I said, it's, it's the biggest of the trombones used in a symphony orchestra. Uh, there is a contrabass below this, there's a tenor and an alto. My principal skill is as a tenor and alto player, but for the last 20 years or so I've been playing bass trombone and I love it very, very much. The Carnix I've been playing for around about 28 years. I've been playing the trombone since I was um, 14 years old, so that's quite a long time now. The reason I was asked to get involved with the Carnix is because the size of the Carnix, and particularly the mouthpiece size, is very, the closest parity, contemporary parity, would be that of a trombone, and actually a tenor trombone, not a bass trombone. So, let me firstly play you the three primary lower register notes on the carnix, just to compare the sound of the carnix and the trombone. Trombone first. <laughs> Okay, fairly standard, and what I'm doing there is playing the trombone using a tongue production, which is basically ta, 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 da, to play those three notes. That's conventional Western brass playing. If I do exactly the same with the carnic, so I'm using the same syllables, There's a very clear relationship. There's a pitch relationship, and you can tell this is the same family of instrument. But you can hear that those three notes are actually quite uneven in their tone quality. In other words, there are wolf notes in there. This instrument is made to have a clarity of sound throughout its range, and it projects everything forward. This instrument was made without any such concept involved. It's obviously for the people who originally made it, the colour of the instrument is the most important thing. If I play a harmonic series on the trombone, I'll keep it in first position. So this is nine feet long in first position. That's the fundamental, it's B-flat. It's a ladder. The steps get closer together as you get higher in the harmonic series. Basically, it works on the principle of having that, what we now consider to be the standard harmonic series that we, we use. This instrument is radically different, and that's because of its structure. If I play its lowest note, that's the lowest note it ought to have. Actually, here's one of its lowest notes. This was very surprising to acoustician friends. It would appear that the um, harmonic series of this instrument starts there. The harmonic series of this instrument starts inside me. How about that? It's lower. It also has a head, just like me. It's harmonic series if I rise up. Same principle, the notes get closer and closer together as you get higher, but you can hear that the steps on the way up are very different. Now, the upper register of any brass instrument is not a clearly defined thing, it's a matter of physical capacity. Every year there seems to be somebody who can play a brass instrument higher, lower and um, faster, you know, louder and quieter. It's an athletic pursuit, actually. Um, but we can say that the basic range of this instrument is very wide. It's very wide indeed. Now, everything I've just been doing 
is conventional brass playing. One of the reasons I'm sitting here at the Knotfire Festival is because I do a lot of unconventional brass playing. So I do things we call extended techniques. Well, what are those extended techniques? Actually, the word is really... Hmm, I don't like the term. There are only techniques. Extended techniques are techniques that um, people find difficult. Once you can do them, rather than like riding a bike, um, they're not difficult anymore, so they're not extended. They're just techniques. So let's say slightly less used techniques or less explored techniques. One of the things that I had been doing with the trombone for many years was finding ways to change the colour of the instrument. Now, composers in the second half of the 20th century particularly had been doing a great deal of this with the trombone. One of the ways we do it, primarily, is to add these things, mutes. And there are a lot of them. I've got over 30 mutes at home. I've only got three with me at the moment. This is a Harman mute. I used this in Anna Chiara's piece, and I also used it in um, Dorian's piece. When I put this instrument, uh, mute into the instrument, it changes the colour and alters, so to a slight extent, the pitch of the instrument. And I'm using my hand here to... It's a Harman or a wah-wah mute because it goes wah-wah. Okay, so what's actually happening there technically is harmonic filtration. It's basically... It's moving from the R part of the vowel spectrum to the E part of the vowel spectrum. A lot of composers love that sound, so do I. Another mute that's frequently used in contemporary scores is this, a, a plunger, which incidentally was originally exactly that, a sink or toilet plunger. This is a bit more expensive, a bit more posh and a bit more stable, but it's essentially still the toilet plunger. Okay, so, oh, and this one, this last one, is uh, a bucket mute. And as I remarked to my friend Joff just a few minutes ago, uh, this was originally called a can of rags because players put waste paper bins in front of their bells filled with rags to soften the quality of sound. <laughs> Very rarely used in orchestral or classical scores, but used a great deal in um, jazz in particular, and big band in particular, and especially with vocal music. Other contemporary texts on techniques on the trombone, this is not a lecture on the trombone, but it's a comparative thing. I'm going to move this onto the carnics. Um, air sound, you can make sounds with just air. Air is very effective. If you use a Harman mute, I can become a giant cat. So the giant cat purring. If I want to activate the length of this tube without my lips, without air, lip vibration, the pitch of the tube itself, the, the length of the tube has a pitch. I can do that with my tongue. It can be quiet, it can be fast. I've got a whole... That's just air. No lip vibration. It's just me going into the instrument and sending a column of air that is the same length as that tube through the instrument. So it becomes an air drum. Okay. Quick little uh, pricey of a few contemporary techniques on the trombone. Now, the Carnix, because of its unusual harmonic series, its size, there's no slide, there's no valves. If I just play it as a conventional brass instrument, it's a bugle. <laughs> Did people do that? 
I very much doubt it. And one of the clues to possible use of the instrument is, is its head. Now, if these people went to such trouble to make such a magnificent, effectively sound sculpture, we could call it, anthropomorphic or zoomorphic thing, um, perhaps the sound of the animal it represents, which is a wild boar, has something to do with its sound, animal sounds. We know the wild boar is very important to Celtic people all over Europe. I mean, that's a massive spread. One thing that united all of these people is that they lived in forested areas, because most of Europe was forested. When the Romans got to Britain, over 90% they were great census takers. Over 90% of these islands were forested. And the land was full of people. Um, you know, there, there were a lot of farmers, a lot of clearing, but the forest was very important. There were wolves, there were bears, and there were wild boars. The wild boar and the British wild boar, described very carefully by Tacitus, the wild boar in Britain, which died out around about 500 years ago, was hunted to extinction, was a very dangerous animal. It could run as fast as a horse. It could take a man's arm off with one bite. And if you didn't die of shock or blood, uh, or loss of blood, you were likely to die of blood poisoning because its saliva was venomous. However, it was very good to eat. Therefore, any warrior not out fighting a battle somewhere or, or killing his neighbors, uh, they were very involved with hunting. And if you went and killed a wild boar or two, you were seriously bringing home the bacon. So the wild boar became a totemic animal for its strength, its intelligence, its wiliness, the fact that it was very good to eat. And human beings wanted to take into themselves part of that almost mythological power, that strength, that providing. It was, if you like, a serious symbol of machismo on a purely practical level. And so it's no accident that we have boar symbols all over the Celtic world. Very much so in Scotland now. In the, I live in Scotland, in the northeast of Scotland especially, there are some of the most ancient of the clans, their symbols, particularly the McKinnons, for instance, it's the wild boar. And this is a wild boar. We don't have wild boar here, but there are wild boar in France, there are wild boar in Germany, all over Czechoslovakia, and uh, they're increasing because now they're protected and they're a bit of a problem. They come into the towns, they read the, raid the bins, they eat everything. Um, and my wife wasn't the least bit surprised to discover that the, the actual vocal range of, um, of the male wild boar, or sanglier, is, is remarkably similar to the male human, actually. And in fact, if we wanted to replace male human organs, the wild boar is a very good animal substitute. Um, so we could say this is a wild boar played by a live boar. In actual fact, one of the things I started to do early on was to search for sounds that were somehow similar to a wild boar. Now, if I go high into the register and lip trill very fast, it's actually quite similar uh, to the anger shrieks of a wild boar. You heard me doing this in the voice of the carnix. And that's a conventional lip trill. Modern instrument, reasonably pretty, but on this instrument it's much wilder. Because the harmonic series is wild. I'm frequently combining my voice with the instrument. It's a unison. Listen to what happens if I move just up and below that unison. Now, this is a standard part of contemporary brass playing. Berio sequenza for trombone, for instance, is based on the word why, and Berio uses a mute to make the trombone say why. Why? Why? The whole thing, the whole piece is based on why. It does sound quite language-like, doesn't it? Stuart Dempster in the Charlie Brown cartoons uses a, har uh, a plunger mute and a trombone to imitate the boring voice of a teacher. I think we've all heard teachers like that. 
Um, now, so therefore, this is part of contemporary brass playing. We put onto the carnix, which doesn't have the pure sound of a trombone. These these things again become much more mysterious, much wilder. I'm also employing a technique that uh, quite a lot of jazz players use, um, and it is present in contemporary music, although many people find it difficult. I'm using circular breathing. Now I can circular breathe on the trombone, but circular breathing on this instrument gets around the fact that this, this tube is hugely wider than a trombone or even a tuba. Just playing straight into the instrument, your air disappears very, very quickly. One facet of Celtic music, which seems to be almost universal and very ancient, is the desire to base music on drones. And of course, the bagpipe is a very, very ancient and widespread instrument, and the bagpipe is, is still a contemporary identifier with both Irish and Scottish folk music, many others as well. Now, a bagpipe is a set of exterior lungs that you either fill with the bellows or with a separate pipe, and effectively a drone is continued by continuing that airflow. The most ancient man-made lip, in, lip reed instrument or ancestor of these instruments in the world is the didgeridoo of Australia. This instrument copied from something 2,000 years old, the didgeridoo makes this look like a baby. The didgeridoo, uh, we're talking 18,000 years at least from the evidence that we have in Australia. And the patterning on those instruments is almost identical to the instruments found when the first Europeans went there and unfortunately started killing off the most ancient continual stream of culture on the face of the planet. A dreadful mark of shame. Thankfully, enough of it and enough of them was left that we can marvel at its continuance. Didgeridoo music is entirely based upon breath, and defying death by, if you like, not breathing or continual breathing and chanting as you do so. We see this in a number of other cultures, but the didgeridoo uh, technique and culture is, is very deep and very remarkable. This instrument is related to that in its form, and therefore I see absolutely no reason not to incorporate circular breathing and the vowel transformation um, that's used in didgeridoo technique onto this instrument. Now, what do I mean by that? I've already said that I use a harmon or a plunger mute to alter the sound of the trombone by using vowel filtration. I don't know if you've ever thought about you musicians out there, but all the instruments we play are constructed to use just a very small range of the vowel colour of language. And that's because in the Indo-European language group, we consider the open R, <coughs> A-E-I-O-U, R-R-R-O. <coughs> these are the carriers of beauty. Pianos go R, ah. drums go O. Oh. Trombones and trumpets go A, A, O, O. If a Western instrument goes something's wrong with it a string is broken or somebody's technique isn't good enough. Now, very often, uh, a young player of a brass instrument might sound a bit like this. That's because inside their mouth, there is a tight restriction. They're literally playing or saying De, de, de. And we want them to be da da da. And now I'll do it wrong. Well, what happens if we want that? And it's now an artistic decision. What's happening? I'm introducing a different tension into the mouth. Not a painful tension, 
but a different one, one that produces a different sound. And actually, we can have any part of the vowel spectrum in our sound. It's just that in Western tradition, we only want a narrow band of it. We say we have five vowels, then we've got a lot of diphthongs. A E I O U. There they all are. They're all there. Now, if I put that into the Kalnix and then search through uh, a, a spectrum of vowel colour, and without wishing to bore you, I've done quite a lot of work listening to uh, ancient languages, um, particularly Old Irish, uh, Contemporary, Gallic and Gaelic, Welsh, Breton, Galician. The phonemes involved are all pronounceable. I'm not Welsh. I missed a couple of syllables out. Never mind. Lots of those are double consonants creating diphthongs or proto vowels. Let's put some of it into a carnix. Let's put my voice over it so that the instrument and the voice are doing slightly different vowel colours. This is obviously a very, very rich resource. It's a language resource, not a song resource. Tonguing. We say we have single tonguing, double tonguing, triple tonguing. Ta ta, taka taka, tadaka tadaka. Those are standard brass playing techniques, wind playing techniques. We do it on everything from the recorder to the tuba. Now, here's a conventional single tongue. Double tongue. Triple tongue. A jazz doodle tongue. Which is soft but fast. What happens if I skim across the harmonic series, loosening the embouchure slightly, so that I'm actually not aiming for a specific pitch, but chattering using those vowel colours? <laughs> I call it chatter tongue because I'm chattering. What happens if I do that without lip vibration? What happens if I breathe into it and flutter tongue, but without lips? What happens if instead of I blow forwards, I play backwards so the lips vibrate backwards? What happens if I do that a little bit more violently? It's a scream. What happens if I trill and sing and then scream backwards? Which is what I do at the end of my piece, The Cry of the Wolf. Because this tube is so large, I have a lot of room to bend a note. On a trombone, I bend notes with slide, which literally allows me to be microtonal. It's very useful for playing a lot of contemporary music. Now, I have no slide on this, but I can actually lip bend a lot. You can hear there's a little bit of vibrato coming in there. Well, we usually in Western music think of vibrato as 
a stylistic or expressive device. But actually, vibrato is an oscillation. Now, you can have oscillations of all sorts. You can have oscillations of pitch, oscillations of volume, and oscillations of color. And if the player has the necessary technique, you can control the speed, the amplitude of those oscillations. Here's an oscillation of pitch. Here's what of dynamic. And here's one of colour. What happens if I put those into combination? Just on one note, that E natural I just played. So you see that, in a sense, the very technical, structural limitation of the Kalnix actually allows an extraordinary, unimpeded flow of energy and air into the instrument, which means that, in fact, its sonic and coloristic possibilities are enormous. They are wider than many conventional Western instruments, precisely because the technical refinements we have introduced into our instruments in order to make them extremely good at doing the job we want them to do, the clarinet, for instance, is, is one of the most perfect of all wind instruments. It is so refined and so wonderful, and yet its very refinement actually also produces restrictions. Uh, players like the great Sarah Watts defeat those by studying very carefully how to use that technical refinement in a different way. I would say that amongst the brass instrument, the trombone, it has the disadvantage in the conventional sense of not having the facility of valves. On the other hand, it has the enormous advantage that it doesn't have those valves, therefore they cannot get in the way. It's a matter of horses for courses. And if we're constructing music in which we are not wishing to play um, diatonic melodies or conventional Western harmony, such instruments are wonderfully useful and effective. There are people who get very excited about the Carnix as a concept. I'm not going to mention any names, uh, but I've had really quite um, um, august composers saying, John, I've transcribed this Bach cantata for such and such and the Karnix, and my heart sinks because that person has listened to me playing a very wide range and extremely fast on this instrument and, um, and wishes to apply it to a piece of comparatively early Western music. Well, that's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen because there is absolutely no way that I can play tunes on this instrument unless they're extremely high and skirting across the harmonic series. If, on the other hand, a composer embraces the very fact that you cannot do such things, but you can do all sorts of other things, that you can create a music of texture, of color, of dynamic range, then there is an entirely different painting to make. Thank you very much indeed. And before I finish, I just want to say a big thank you to uh, Elizabeth and Duncan for inviting me to be a part of the Not Far Festival, which should have happened in May 2020 and would have consisted of a whole four days of 
workshops and concerts and meetings between performers and composers. There would have been concerts here in the University of Nottingham, concerts in Nottingham Cathedral. Collaborations uh, would have abounded. We went in a, a... It wasn't possible to do that in the way originally envisaged, but it's been absolutely marvellous to be here and to work in this lovely space. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to Joff, who's done the recordings, the engineering, and um, has been great to work with over the last two days, these two days being the first of the new British lockdown. It's been great. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>